Dear brothers and sisters in Christ, on the 27th of November, the Holy Church commemorates the great martyr Iokovos James the Persian. We read in the Cynic Syrian, Iakovos, the glorious great martyr of Christ, was from Persia. He lived during the years of emperors Arcadius in the east, 383-408, and Honorius in the west, 395-423, the sons of the great Theodosius. Iokovos abided in Vflavan of Persia, situated in the land of Iliozi, Ilozijan. It was then that Isgirdis, 399-425, and Behram V, his son, ruled over the Persians. They were cruel and pitiless men. They forced the Christians, whomever they found, to worship as they did the senseless idols. Now, Iagovus was a lord of merit, notable and of good service to the nation. He was honored and beloved by all as he was wealthy, knowledgeable, and virtuous. He therefore was first in the palace, and the king exceedingly loved him. He bestowed on him great importance and abundant gifts. So much did his Digirdus and his son Behram love Iokovos, that they did not wish to be separated even one hour from him. They displayed such favor that they had him as a brother, for he was well-mannered and his family prominent. This came about so that they could cunningly lure him to impiety, for Iarchivus was a Christian from childhood, just as his parents and wife who were pious and faithful to our Lord Jesus Christ. Therefore, these villains tried hard to estrange him with gifts and privileges. They elected to be good-natured and discreet, and to persuade him with benefits and flatteries rather than with threats and torments. However, this marvelous Iacobus, who resisted at first, was defeated by the many generous favors of the ruler and, alas, was captured. He denied the most sweet Christ and worshipped the demons and became one in spirit with the king. Do not, however, frown, O listeners. Hearken and strengthen your heart. Attend to this. For just as one drop of water continually dripping onto the hard marble eventually perforates it, so can many presents and per perquisites convert the gratified soul with ease and quickness. Thus did the ever-memorable one have the solid rock of his faith hollowed out. But hearken to how he finished to receive exaltation and joy, because God, who foreknows and foresees all, does not overlook to the end but he dispenses to straighten the fallen and illuminate the way of the blind. It was circulated around the land that Iacobus had denied Christ. This news came into the ears of his mother and spouse, who were wounded in their hearts upon hearing these unexpected words. Since they were not present to censure the words uttered by his tongue, they sent him a letter writing thus, it was not proper to thy nobility to exchange falsehood for the truth, to defraud the faith for the honor of men and temporary rewards, which pass by as a dream and disperse like smoke, and to love the perishable and temporary kingdom, and abandon immortality and eternity. For this violation thou wouldest elect to be cast into the inextinguishable fire and endless torment. Thou, who art unworthy of his love, hast denied Christ in order to gain one warm eaten man. O oh, the mindlessness! What art thou able to benefit by them when thou goest together into torment? We have been greatly distressed by thee and pour forth many tears. And with all our hearts we pray to the true God not to desert thee, as he is compassionate but to receive thy return." So recognize the mischief that thou hast created by becoming a son of darkness instead of light, whom thou wast formerly. Recover and revert again to godliness. And if thou dost not repent speedily, know this, thou shalt no longer have any relation with us. Indeed, we wish to be as strangers and foreigners to thee, and thou shalt inherit nothing from us, so as to be completely separated from our society. 
because not one particle of communion has light with darkness and the faithful with the faithless. So make a good return. Though thou hast departed badly, yet the master whom thou hast denied will receive thee with open arms and rejoicing. If thou shouldest disdain our advice and tears, expect that whenever thou shouldest reach the divine tribunal, that thou shalt be punished in torment endlessly, but thy weeping shall be in vain. These things Iacobus read in the letter, and he remained in a stupor, indeed, as if from sleep and drunkenness he was roused as he came to realize how he had become destitute of the treasure of the faith and how he had tumbled into the evil of error he tried bitterly and he cried bitterly and repented from his heart of the former things he beat his breast lamenting and crying before the master to forgive the iniquity as he is compassionate in imitation of manasseh and Peter's repentance, he studied the Holy Scriptures and recalled the bitter punishments. He was not able to cease his sobbing, and it was evident he repented of his former impiety. Consequently, certain idolaters perceived and learned the reason for his disquiet. The cult calumniated him to the king, whose heart was wounded on hearing such things. Infuriated, he summoned the Yochobos for questioning and inquired if he were a Nazarene. Iacobus answered boldly and eagerly, Yes, I am a slave of my Lord Jesus Christ. The king's rage grew, but he remembered their previous friendship, so he did not make a display or an outburst of anger. As in preceding times, he tested Iacobus with flatteries and by promising gifts, but at other times he threatened hideous punishments and torments to see, perchance, if he would waver. But the cowardly king was not effective, because the saint now thirsted for martyrdom. The blessed Iokovus, in order to cause the tyrant to slay him quickly, answered him thus, In vain thou laborest, attempting with feeble means to sow wheat in the gulf or to hold back the winds in a net. In this way, it is not possible any longer to change my belief from piety. So then, lay aside all hope, so as not to conceal thy wrath any longer. Cut my body into pieces, punish it, burn it, do with it as thou wilt. But, my soul, thou wilt not be able to turn to godlessness. Again the king tempted him with flatteries to ensnare him. Hiding his anger, he said to him with feigned love, Eochobus, pity thy body, thy blossoming manhood. Remember our immeasurable friendship. Be not deprived of any worldly pleasures in this sweet life. In order to receive harsh pains and the bitterest death for these uncertain good hopes, I promise thee that thou wilt have wealth and power in my kingdom, greater than before. Yes, my beloved and dearest friend, I entreat thee not to have contempt for our great friendship, and appear before me ungrateful, because if thou wilt continue to disobey, it is necessary, although I do not wish it, that thou shouldest be taught a lesson. But do not think that I will be lenient later. Nay, it is not true, for I will change the love that I have for thee now into hatred that is commensurate with thy disobedience, and I will deliver thee to unheard of and horrible torments. On hearing these things, the blessed Iochobus replied, saying, O king, do not spend thy time unreason unseasonably. Do not attempt to frighten me with torments, nor sincerely com compliment me with tributes and gifts, nor insincerely compliment me with tributes and gifts, because I despise from my heart all temporal enjoyments, empty glory, decaying riches, and bodily sensuality, in order that I might inherit the true wealth and the honor, inexpressible delight and bliss. Whereupon gladly I divest myself of wealth and glory, friends and relatives, mother, wife, and all the pleasures of the body. And not only these things, but also ten thousand deaths am I prepared to receive, so as only not to injure my sweet Christ, the beautiful one among the sons of men, who fashioned the sun, moon, and the remainder of creation, and his divine will is equal to his power. He who denies him goes to endless death. This and other things were uttered by the blessed Iokovos.
The king went into a furious rage, realizing it was impossible to pervert him. Therefore he took counsel with a certain senator, who recommended such severity that upon hearing it the king shuddered. This is what he proposed. Dissever the joints, starting first with the fingers of Iokovus's hands, and afterward the remainder of the joints. On the in oh, the inhuman decision! What other unsparing tyrant ever revealed such pitilessness toward his friend? O oh, savage judgment and inexorable, merciless soul! Whoever heard it felt empathy, not only the faithful, but even those godless idolaters among the nations wept at such a ferocious verdict. But our true martyr did not think shrink back upon hearing such a sentence. Rather, he hastened to the stadium with its excessive joy and eagerness. A large portion of the population assembled in order to witness the hideous sight. Not only people, but also angels and demons were present at this mighty contest and violent duel. The angels were present in order to assist the saint invisibly to receive the crown, and the adversaries to prevent him, if possible, and to frustrate his purpose. Also, the word of the apostle was fulfilled. We became a spectacle to the world, both to angels and to men. For even the great promoter of contests and heavenly king was present. He stood above Iokovis in order to strengthen him in this match and, in the end, to grant him the imperishable crown. As the admirable and magnanimous man observed the fierce executioners and the forbidding instruments with which they were to cut him into pieces, he did not fear those devices prepared. Every kind soul, seeing another suffering thus, would feel sorrow and pity for him as a man. Iokovus, however, did not show any gloom and never uttered anything foul, nor did he suffer to do anything unworthy of his valor. Much rather, as though his flesh were insensible, he stood with a joyous glance and cheerful face. The executioners tied the hands and feet of the martyr. Afterward, they placed his right arm on the anvil, saying to him, Behold, what will happen to thee for thy disobedience? We have been instructed to cut off thy members one by one, thy fingers, hands, feet, arms, ankles, knees, and finally thy head. Therefore, come to reason before thou dost taste these horrors, and do that which is for thine own good, for there is no repentance afterward. Certain of Iokovus's friends and acquaintances implored him with tears to have pity on himself and not voluntarily receive such a horrendous and evil death. The saint answered them, Weep not for me, O wretched ones, but lament for yourselves and your children, as you will go to everlasting damnation with your gods for these temporal pleasures. I, though for one day's pain, shall inherit the kingdom of my Lord Jesus Christ, and also indescribable joy and everlasting bliss. After saying these things, he noticed that the executioners were readying their tools to cut off his limbs. Consequently, he asked for time that he might offer up prayer to the Lord. He then prayed that God might strengthen and assist him to complete the contest and receive the crown of martyrdom. They then began the martyrdom of the holy Iokovus. The executioners first cut off his thumb, while Iokovus turned heavenward and said, O Lord Jesus Christ, the help of all those who are helpless, the one of all the hopeless, and the strength of all the weak. Receive the first branch of this tree by thy mercy, for as the vineyard gives forth leaves even when it is trimmed, thus will I appear before thy judgment seat, safe and upright, on the day of resurrection. When they cut off his second finger, he said, Receive, O Lord, the second branch of the tree that thy right hand hath planted. His face was joyous and festive, as if he perceived our Lord's future endowments. endowments. As the cutting off of the third finger, he said, With the three use in the furnace, I sing to thee and honor thee, O Lord, with the choirs of martyrs. I sing praises to Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. At the fourth, he said, Thou who dost accept praise from the tetramorphs, accept the suffering of these four fingers. At the fifth, with my five senses, I bless thee. May my rejoicing be as great as that of the five wise virgins. At the sixth, praise be to thee, O Lord, 
who stretched out thy pure arms upon the cross, and who vouchsafed me to offer six fingers. At the seventh, even as David glorified thee seven times a day, I glorify thee with these seven cut off for thy sake. At the eighth, thou thyself givest rest on the eighth day. At the ninth, at the ninth hour, thou didst commend thy spirit into the Father's hands, and so I offer thee thanks for the suffering of this ninth finger. At the tenth, upon a ten-stringed lute, I sing and bless thee for having vouchsafed me to endure the cutting away of my ten fingers for the ten commandments written upon stone tablets. Certain of his friends who stood by said to him, crying bitterly, Beloved brother, have pity upon thyself, for they will administer upon thee an evil death, and in losing thy life thou wilt be deprived of thy mother and wife, and the rest of life's enjoyments. Do not grieve for thy fingers, as we have physicians here capable of cauterizing them. Thou hast sufficient wealth, and dost not require the use of thy hands. So listen to us, for thine own good, and just say one small word with thy mouth, so that it will appear as if thou hast complied with the king's command, and thereby thou wilt be delivered from the evil torturers. But in thy heart thou canst believe in God, and when thou returnest again to thy territory, thou canst repent and ask forgiveness of him. And he answered them, God forbid, I will not commit such a pretense. One cannot serve two masters. Whosoever puts his hand to the plow and turns back is not worthy of the heavenly bliss. It is not right for me to love my mother and wife more than I love my God and Savior. Whosoever does not lift up his cross to follow Christ is not is an unworthy slave. For these small pains I go to my master to receive the laurel of martyrdom. Therefore I pray thee, do not sorrow for me, but rejoice and be glad with me. As the executioners heard this, they cut off the toes of his feet, one by one, in order to subject him to even more pain. But he was firm and adamant thanking them at the severing of each toe, and singing an appropriate hymn. At one point, he was heard to say, The afflictions of the present are not worthy of the future glory. At other times, he encouraged himself, saying, Why is my soul saddened? And many other verses. Then they cut off his feet at the ankles. Next, they severed his legs at the knees. Afterward, they mercilessly cut off his hands and arms. But the resolute one endured all this with greatness of a soul, as he was, as he saw his fingers, hands, and legs on the ground. He did not utter one angry word at the executioners or the judge, but only prayed incessantly in order to comfort and encourage himself with verses from the Old Testament, such as, I will sing to the Lord during my life. I will chant to my God as long as I exist. May my discourse be sweet to him and... I will take delight in the Lord. Behold, true martyric valor. Behold thy wonders, O Christ King. How did the Invincible One withstand such rigorous pains and afflictions? O listeners, were you not awe-stricken, or was not your soul grieved at the sight of such an unprecedented mutilation? All those who were present in this fearful and horrid sight, not only the faithful, but even the persecutors and the very senseless rocks, must have felt pity. Only that unbending soul and friend of Christ did not and friend of Christ did not weep, but withstood those terrifying and awful tortures with a serene and cheerful countenance. For such is the nature and custom of divine love. When it possesses a noble soul and empowers it to overcome nature and not to fear pains and punishments, without this power it would have been impossible for him to bear so many torments. Unlike the others who, for the loss of an arm or leg, died instantly, being unable to bear the excruciating pain, but the praiseworthy and ever-blessed one did not experience three or ten deaths, but twenty or thirty. His wounds ran rivers of blood. The flesh fell, the veins were severed, the nerves plucked out, the arteries destroyed, the members scattered. The audience fainted, and the executioners grew weary. The demons, having been vanquished, were horror-stricken and panicked. The angels marveled, 
but he that endured seemed joyous, and his eye was not morbid but cheerful, and he looked merry rather than dismembered. Then they cut off the thighs of the martyr, and the pain was so acute that he cried out, saying, Christ, help me. And the executioner said to him, Did we not tell thee that thou wouldst suffer extreme pains and tortures, and thou didst not believe us? Now ask thy God to save thee from these punishments. And he answered, I do not ask Christ to rescue me from the torments, but to strengthen me till the end, so that I may receive the laurel, O senseless ones. I felt pain in order to prove that I am in the flesh, but earlier all of my mind was riveted on my Lord Jesus Christ, who lessened my pains, and I did not feel anything. Truly, just as the anvil is struck by the hammer and feels nothing, also I felt nothing as I was being tormented. Therefore, I thank my God and beg of you not to feel sad for me, but to dissolve this old structure of my flesh, that a new and brighter one will be raised up. Since you have cut off the branches, do not hesitate to chop down the tree, also that I may receive the heavenly bliss. For just as a heart wishes to reach the rivers of water, so I desire in death to attain my Creator. Even though he was dismembered thus, yet the Invincible One safeguarded his piety and won trophies against all of them, with the aid of the Holy Spirit in his unsurpassed desire. He remained, therefore, only with his head and torso, a dreadful sight to behold. Alas, but the villainous ruler, seeing that, were frightened, even though he who was dismembered feared not. They had no further hope for him, so they ordered his honored head to be cut off as the other members of his body. They ordered this not because of any merciful sentiments or sympathy, but from their excessive shame, so that it would not seem that Eochavus had defeated them. Dismembered thus, and that the invincible majesty of the Lord might not be confessed in the saint. After the decision, the saint was solaced somewhat. He moved his honored head with difficulty and prayed thus, O Lord, Father Almighty, and Lord Jesus Christ, and the Most Holy Spirit, I thank thee that thou hast enabled me to endure these torments for thy holy name. But I pray thee, Make me worthy to complete this contest, for the pangs of Hades encircled me. They have severed all my limbs. I have no legs to stand on and worship thy majesty, nor hands to lift up to heaven to pray and call thy name. They left me neither knees nor arms, the merciless ones, but abide as a branchless tree with roots. But I abide as a branchless tree with roots. Therefore I beseech thee, O most holy king, abandon not thy servant, but take my soul out of the prison of my body, and place it among the holy martyrs, so that we may glorify forever thy majesty in the ages to come. Amen. After he had said these things, they cut off his honorable head, and thus he achieved all those indescribable blessings. Eye hath not seen, and ear hath not heard, and neither hath it entered into the heart of man the things which God prepared for those who love him. If then, as St. Paul says, each one of us will receive a reward according to his own labor, how great will be the reward of him who died ten thousand deaths, and witnessed suffering above all human endurance. In all truth, he just as the pains and anguish were atrocious, so will the pleasures be painless, the rewards countless, the delights unutterable, and the crowns glorious. The blessed Eochavus received his martyrdom in Babylon on Friday, the 27th of November. Immediately afterwards, certain Christians, beloved of God, approached the guards and offered them money in order to permit them to take part of his holy relics. But out of fear for the king, they did not wish to consent to this. Then the pious ones left, as if to depart, but actually they hid nearby and awaited until it was dark to procure at least a part of the relics. And at the, as the night wore on and the guards fell asleep, the pious Christians crept forward quietly and carried away the precious relics of the martyr. They buried them devoutly and with honor. As an everlasting memorial and remembrance to the glory and praise of our Lord Jesus Christ, to whom is due honor, hymns, and worship, with the Father and the All Holy and Life Giving Spirit, now and ever and unto the ages of ages. Amen. Through the prayers of the great martyr Eochavus, the Persian, Lord Jesus Christ, our God, have mercy on us.